Good evening. Thank you for all joining us tonight. I'm Pamela Horn, Director of Cross-Platform Publishing and Strategic Partnerships at Cooper Hewitt's Smithsonian Design Museum, and we're so pleased that you're here for this evening's design talk, inspired by the jazz age, American style in the 1920s. The Associated Press calls the jazz age a multi-sensory blockbuster of a show, and it's so true. I'm hoping that you all have seen it, and if not, that you'll be able to find your way to the galleries. It's here through August. Uh, the music and the era, both recorded and live, uh, activate our uh, galleries, and they highlight these sumptuous textiles, the furniture, architecture, industrial design, and of course, fashion. The clothing, shoes, and jewelry on view are a lavish interplay of color, texture, light, and form that could only lead to a sensory overload. And if the silk, rhinestone, and satin green shoes go missing, don't look at me. Fashion's revolutionary designs of the 1920s were driven in part by the rising influence of American women in the world. With the power to vote finally achieved in 1920, American women were moving beyond traditional confines of the home with roles of homemaker and they were moving into the workforce. They also traveled and shopped more widely and especially uh, in Paris and New York City thanks to modern ocean liners built to transport them back and forth the Atlantic. All of these fascinating developments and more will be the focus of tonight's discussion among fashion historians Caroline Milbank and Jan Reeder and Sarah Coffin, the exhibition's curator. Caroline Reynolds Milbank is a cataloger and appraiser of antique and couture clothing, formerly of Sotheby's, where she was also in char charge of the antique clothing auctions and is so currently for Doyle, New York. She has also curated several exhibitions on fashion, and her writing has appeared in Vogue, Architectural Digest, the New York Times magazines, and many other publications. She's contributed essays to several museum catalogs and books, and published numerous works of fashion history, including the sumptuous fashion, a timeline in photographs, 1850 through today. Caroline is also a member of Cooper Hewitt's Collections Committee. Jan Glyer Reeder has broad experience in the field of costume and textiles as auction house specialist, appraiser, curator, and author. From 2005 to 2009, she was curator and director of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded costume documentation project at the Brooklyn Museum which is a three-year initiative assessing and inventorying the museum's historic 25,000-piece fashion collection. She also curated American High Style, fashioning a national collection for the Brooklyn Museum and authored the accompanying publication. In 2014, she co-curated and authored the Metropolitan Museum's, Metropolitan Museum's exhibition and publication, Charles James, Beyond Fashion, with the Costume Institute's curator in charge, Harold Coda. I'll now turn the uh, stage over to our panelists and speakers. Enjoy the evening. Good evening. Jesse Franklin Turner was the first American fashion designer to establish a financially successful and long-term couture business in New York. For the 20 years from the time she opened her first salon in 1922 until her retirement in 1942, she provided a range of luxurious... Le okay, uh, le leisure-based clothing suited to the active and privileged lifestyles of American society's most distinguished women, and the international Beaumont as well. An early participant in post-World War I nationalistic campaign to establish a uniquely Amer American design idiom, she, unlike her contemporaries, neither bought, sold, 
nor copied Paris fashions and did not rely upon Parisian or, or French design as a source of inspiration. Looking instead to the arts of the Near and Far East, ethnographic cultures, and European art historical works. Casual sports dresses of hand Casual sports dresses of hand-decorated textiles for attending outdoor spectator activities such as polo matches, horse and dog shows, as you might see here, day dresses for warm weather climbs, especially Palm Beach, bathing and bridal wear were all on offer at her salon, along with the feminine, elegant at-home evening gowns, which were her specialty. She gained an international reputation for her beautiful tea gowns, a form of intimate attire initially appropriate only to be worn in the privacy of the boudoir or at moments with intimate friends at home, but which in her hands became works of fashion art to increasingly be worn out and about to anything but the most formal public affairs. Turner's textiles were custom designed, woven, and dyed with colors devised by her in her own workrooms. She did at times use high-end French, especially Rodier fabrics, but had them also woven to her specifications as well. She also had a large private cache, cache of antiques and world textiles that she was constantly augmenting for use in her designs and trims dress parts, and whole garments. The well-heeled Turner uh, clientele attracted were the upper echelons of America's social, artistic, and theatrical realms. As she put it, they were not necessarily the richest or involved in the most spectacular phases of society, but are the women who really make society in America. They appreciated clothing as art and sought to distinguish themselves by wearing attire that was apart from fashion trends. As Turner put it, independent of fashion. What you're looking at here are actually ads uh, that um, Jesse published, but I wanted to point out the kind of woman that she was uh, uh, designing for, sort of strong, strong-minded, independent, um, intellectual people who, uh, women who were um, individualists and they were not necessarily glamorous but distinctive looking. The socially elite clientele hailed from the high profile families who developed and sustained America's industrial, mercantile, and financial sectors with names such as Goodyear, Morton, as in Salt, Whitney, Vanderbilt, Strawbridge, as in department stores, Gould and Warburg, and E.F. Hutton, of course, in finance. Turner was already prominent in these rarefied social circles by 1924, when she designed the clothes for the wedding of Cornelia Stuyvesant Vanderbilt and Sir John Amherst Cecil, held at Biltmore, the family's estate, in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. So on your right is the bride on the eve of her wedding wearing a design by Jesse Franklin Turner. It, it is known as the bird dress because it is embroidered with tiny uh, mina, bird, uh, uh, mina birds. And the, on the left is my Yes, is my favorite, uh, one of my favorite photos of all time. And here is Mrs. Um, Cornelia, no, Florence Vanderbilt, Twombly Burden, uh, also uh, wearing either the same dress or I'm not, it looks to me like exactly the same dress, but um, uh, anyway, she's wearing it very nonchalantly uh, with her St. Bernard and, uh, and at the dog show. Uh, the caption meeting best dog in show. <laughs> <laughs> and keep in mind this dress because I'm going to say a little bit more about it uh, later. Here's the wedding party at the, um, at the Biltmore 
because it's obviously a very grand affair. Uh, the bridesmaids' dresses were of Japanese silk printed with blue and white floral pattern. And you can get a little sense of it there. It seems to me it's quite unusual uh, for a um, bridesmaid dress in that, uh, at that time. Um, it's an interesting note that um, the, uh, the maid of honor wore Lanvin, not, not Jesse. Turner also dressed some of the most uh, well-heeled artistic crowd. The set and costume designer, Eileen Bernstein, the first woman to be accepted into the United Scenic Artists Union in 1926, and later a founder of the Museum of Costume, uh, which became the Costume Institute at the Met, uh, was a friend and client. Um, here is one of her uh, dresses that is in the Costume Institute, and you'll note that the um, the embroidered uh, textile on the dress is, I, I believe, is an authentic uh, um, uh, ethnographic uh, piece. Given their theatricality and distinctiveness, it's not surprising that Turner's designs attracted all of the prominent American actresses appearing on the New York stage during the 20s and 30s. They wore her fashions, mostly the elaborate at-home attire, on and off the stage and posing in fashion editorials. The list is a who's who of marquee names. Ilka Chase, Faye Bainter, Cornelia Otis Skinner, Barbara Stanwyck, June Knight, and Dorothy Gish were all among the headliners. Uh, you're looking at Ina Clare in a medieval gown designed by Jessie that she wore in the 1930 film, The Royal Family. And here is Elka Chase in a beautiful uh, tea, fringe tea gown in 1928. Um, I'll just mention that beginning in 1928-29 was the beginning of Jessie's real heyday. And um, tea gowns became uh, very much more a part of fashion again after the Roaring Twenties when uh, no one was lying around and everyone was busy uh, running. The pace was very hectic and then when the 30s came, uh, the pace slowed down. People were staying at home or um, prohibition was lifted uh, and so the tea gown uh, once again became very popular. Um, Here's Thelma Tipson. She's not as well known, but I love this image of her. Um, she was in, in a play called The Blessed Event, and the caption read, ready for lounging, or it seems to me, whatever. <laughs> 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 um, in, uh, in PJs, pajamas of flesh-colored satin with flowing wings and a belt of Chinese yellow tipped with red. Very typical uh, uh, Turner color combinations. And finally, actresses June Knight uh, in an evening coat made from a, an antique Russian priest's uh, robe. It's a, it's a, the textile is a brocade made from a, that, from a robe. Uh, and Marta Abba, who was starring in Tabarich at that time, 1936, in uh, lapis lazuli wool pajamas with a red jacket um, with antique Indian mirror embroidery. The publicity generated by these prominent displays of Jessie's elegant um, team finery spread her fame beyond national borders and I propose established her as the first American designer to have an influence on the international fashion scene. An unidentified theater program from 1933 asserted, nothing more readily induces an alluring languor than a trailing tea gown. The fashioning of such gowns is a highly specialized field, and although it's traditional that y they do these things better abroad, it's a field led beyond question by an American, Jesse Franklin Turner. Born in Peoria, Illinois, in 1881, Jessie began her career 
in women's leisure-based fashion as a teenager when she convinced the proprietor of a local lingerie store to hire her with the promise of improving the quality and range of his merchandise. Through a series of related jobs in the Midwest and then in New York, her talents for choosing and working with world textiles caught the attention of Paul Bonwit, co-founder of the specialty department store Bonwit Teller. And he hired her initially uh, to be the oriental buyer, but increasingly uh, she became uh, a designer as well. And there she is about, she's about age 30, and that's uh, uh, 1910, he hired her in 1911. Um, by 1915, at Bonwitz, uh, Bonwitz had um, uh, uh, commissioned Jesse to open a factory in the Philippines to produce a fine uh, linen uh, lingerie. And the, um, uh, the caption on this reads, from, from specially designed models and patterns distinctively bond with teller and which for fineness are the full equal of French undergarments. So early on, she was in on the French-American rivalry. These are um, models that were published in Vogue uh, in 1919, sort of almost at the end of her tenure at Bonwitz, and um, uh, they, they don't credit her. Bonwitz never credited her. But um, I'm very sure that these are uh, her designs. And you can see they're very languorous and very full and a lot, have a lot of volume at this, at this stage. Uh, in fact, it said, now that the war is over, we can be as luxuriously draped and voluminous and feminine as ever. A major... Uh, connection that Jessie made uh, when she was at Bonwitz was uh, with Paul Bonwitz's friend, the fashion impresario Morris de Camp Crawford, known as MDC, who by 1915 was fashion editor of the industry's trade paper, Women's Wear, and a research fellow in the Department of Anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, here you, you see a typical uh, Crawford spread in women's wear in his uh, um, column, uh, and, and here he's promoting the costume from world cultures. His column was called Design Department. Um, the interruption of flow of creative inspiration and fine materials from Europe, particularly Paris, precipitated by the onset of World War I, galvanized Crawford and other influential New York industry and museum leaders, particularly Herbert Spinden of the American Museum of Natural History and Stuart Kulin um, uh, at the Brooklyn Museum, to spearhead a campaign to develop a distinctively American design identity in fashion and textiles. The idea was to encourage uh, designers to use the rich ethnographic resources of museum collections in order to find inspiration that would lead to that end. I think that this quote from Henry uh, Osborne, who was the president of the American Museum of Natural History at that time, sums it up rather nicely. I'm very optimistic about the influence of this to, an, to create an independent American taste to design. The significance is that the personal decoration of women should reflect their spirit and morale, and not that of women of another country. The American woman has certain distinct ideas about life and conduct, and these ideas should be reflected in her dress, more or less. The American women should not express in their clothing decadence, which is so widespread in the countries of Europe today. 
Uh, recognizing Turner's talents in textiles and fashion, Crawford chose her, her to be the featured designer for the campaign. Um, he published a picture of one of the first garments uh, that she made for this initiative in the December 1917 issue of Vogue. It was, so that's the spread, actual spread in Vogue. Um, and uh, the garment was a luxurious, free-flowing, at-home gown of soft silk rose duvetine and blue chiffon with wool embroidery. And that is on your right. It is Turner's interpretation of the skin, fur, and sinew dancing coat with bead embroidery worn by the Koryak peoples of Siberia from the collection at the uh, American Museum of Natural History. And that one is, of course, on your left. The skillful transposition of the original artifact's ceremonial function and protective materials to a modern at-home gown of soft, filmy fabric accented with fur as a luxurious trim rather than as a protective uh, material, expertly illustrated Crawford's mission to create a unique American design by interpreting rich global museum resources into modern uh, objects. And this is what she continued to do throughout her career. The combination for uh, uh, of this um, uh, campaign, this two-year campaign, uh, was uh, the exhibition that was entitled, um, as you see on the on the screen, um, the it's a long name. The exhibition of industrial art in textiles and costumes. Uh, this is the uh, Jessie had her own uh, exhibition space, which was uh, there were only a, f a handful of them, and um, you can see um, the the idea of the exhibition was to show uh, modern uh, modern objects and cre creations and their and their historic inspirations. So um, here uh, you can see this is this is a Coptic. Uh, um, design, which I believe is there. Um, these are Persian tent panels, and I think they're, there's their in, inspiration, or their um, contemporary um, form. And this is, uh, I think, at the tur Turkish coat, and there is the wonderful uh, classic Turner tea gown with that pattern on the back. Sorry. So Turner's experiences as buyer and designer, her travels abroad, and her close relationships with New York's top museum and fashion industry personnel, as well as Bonwit's socially elite clients, set her in a unique position when she set out on her own. These images from her first salon exemplify her signature mix of contemporary aesthetics and the timelessness of ancient cultures upon which she built her, her professional identity and which today we would call branding. The salon was designed by her in conjunction with Park Avenue galleries. The scheme is silver, chartreuse, and black. Both the walls and the ceilings are in silver leaf. You can picture that. The sofa is silver velvet, which she designed. Uh, and, and the sofa has green and black piping, which is a favorite dressmaking detail that she used uh, from, uh, that she adopted from Persian clothing. So you can see that there. Um, the woodwork and the drapes are a vivid chartreuse, and the floor is a jade green. And the Buddha image over the black sofa all create this sort of overall Asian, uh, I think, uh, aesthetic. But in contrast, um, the contemporary 
light panel with a, a geometric shape. Uh, the lamps, you see the lamps there. And um, also uh, what you can't see was an ebony cabinet inlaid with silver zigzag pattern, which was clearly a, a contemporary deco piece. Um, all add the contemporary uh, 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 sensibility to the uh, uh, to the room. Um, and there are also two Second Empire side slide side chairs that add a historical note to add to the eclectic uh, uh, grouping. I think that you can see these two gowns, one very deco in feel, the black and white one, and the other cut like a Turkish robe uh, with her characteristic piping. Along here. Uh, they both, I think both of those belong in that room. Now, just uh, a moment uh, about the textiles. Um, her, uh, as you remember before, the woman with the dog and the bride wearing this uh, a textile that is just uh, like the ones on the screen now. The um, the inspiration for this for those textiles uh, is this small little blouse uh, that is from Delhi, and um, it, it's. Um, a very common form, I think, that was worn by Parsi women. Uh, it's a miracle that it has survived because it belonged to, it was in MDC Crawford's collection and somehow it finally ended up in the Brooklyn Museum collection and fortunately we were able to get it transferred along with the costumes from Brooklyn so that it would still be with its friends. Um, and. You can see that there's a, an address in the collection that is, has the bird embroidery on it. She also produced this textile in woven forms, so it was a, it was a, a major a product in her early years. Uh, finally, um, I think these two uh, pieces exemplified her use of, uh, of antique fabrics as well as her interpretation of the an antique fabrics on your uh, right is, uh, on your left is, is a dress uh, that I think is fashioned from, from an antique piece and on your right is a wonderful exotic uh, woman wearing a, a, a jacket custom, in a custom woven uh, contemporary textile. And finally, um, this is, uh, <laughs> I have to always end with this wonderful image. Um, she uh, uh, created a beautiful uh, tea gown using pieces from the Russian priest's priest robe and made an uh, identical uh, 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 advertisement uh, um, with the portrait of a young woman by a Antonio Pavolo from 1465. Um, so uh, I hope it's, you can see how Jesse has uh, sort of moved, um, um, did it, used her same techniques and strategies as she developed in the 20s throughout her career uh, uh, and uh, never wavered from her belief that um, she could create designs that were all uh, from her own her own aesthetic and uh, were not reliant on any other design um, uh, inspiration. So thank you. Excuse us while we'll do a little change over here.
I'm, gonna, I'm Sarah Coffin, for those of you who don't know, and I'm head of the Product Design and Decorative Arts Department and the uh, lead Cooper Hewitt curator on uh, the, the Jazz Age exhibition, and Emily Orr, who's the assistant curator uh, for it and for American t Modern and Contemporary Design. Uh, we thought we'd start out with my and Emily asking a couple of questions. However, both your presentations were so full that I I'm rather inclined to totally trash them and ask you and ask you another one at least to start out. I think you answered a couple uh, in your presentations. But uh, I, one of the things that I came to realize in doing in this show is there's a huge cross-fertilization between designers of all media. And you mentioned Jan that um, about Paul Rodier with uh, Jesse Franklin Turner and Paul Frankel, the architect designer, actually carried Paul Rodier's fabrics in his New York gallery. And you can see some of these fabrics as used as a blotter and as a chair cover in the Mario Lago uh, desk and chair that is up in the exhibition. So I just, I, I think that even it's so important to realize that fashion, in addition to, uh, as Ca Caroline said, the idea of movement and uh, liveliness and the mixture of exoticism which plays such a role uh, is very important. The other comment I would just make is that a lot of my work had to do with the use of museums as sources of design. The Met had a program for encouraging manufacturers to design not direct reproductions, although people did that too, but to use the collections as a source of design and certainly your discussion of the Natural History Museum as a source of design um, certainly plays into what was the use of the Ruhlmann furniture for the Company of Master Craftsmen and 18th century furniture uh, for uh, consumer use. And this intense sense of moral rectitude that went with it. In other words, dispensing good taste in a broader context. It could be modern, but introducing people to the idea of what's going on in Europe or elsewhere by supporting trade. And there's a great deal of interaction of trade in museums. So uh, we get the Macy's 28 exhibition, and Robert DeForest, the president of the Metropolitan Museum, writes the forward and has his two curators curating along with famous people. But to get back to the questions, um, I would just wanted to see what, for both of you, what you what was the role of the press, magazines, and newspapers, and how did uh, the coverage differ for uh, Jesse Franklin Turner or the American other American fashion houses or individuals from uh, the French uh, designs being marketed either abroad or to an American market? Do you want to start, Jen? Well, of course the. Um, Fashion magazines, Vogue uh, and Harper's were incredibly uh, influential. It seems to me that in the uh, uh, in the twenties, um, Vogue was still somewhat of a social magazine. Would you agree with that, Caroline? At this at that point, um, and Jesse uh, got very little coverage in Vogue. There were those two pieces that I, I showed you. Um, and that was very early on, 21 and 22, and then there was nothing at all until 1928 when suddenly the idea of the tea gown burst onto the scene again. Um, and then um, there was more, then it really picked up in the 30s, and Harper's didn't uh, report on her until 1932. So, um, and I think the fashion magazines were, um, really became, I would say, more influential starting more in the 30s um, in terms of that cross-fertilization. Do you, what do you think in terms of the... Um, yes, the major f fashion magazines were extremely francophilic, and a lot of people have said that that's because the editors all wanted to go to Europe all the time, and... <laughs> Um, so there was quite a bit of that, but um, one of the th nice things about the internet is that um, after 
doing research in Paris magazine, I mean, Paris-oriented magazines all these years, I've now found all these other um, publications that were directed at the American industry. And there are things like Coat and Suit Review that don't sound as fun as Harper's Bazaar. They didn't have air take covers, but they did have so much information about the huge amount of people who um, were um, doing every aspect of manufacturing. Of course, ready to wear um, essentially was invented here and um, was a giant business. So there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, if not thousands, who were involved and they just didn't get um, their credit by name. In the 30s, one of the things that happened that was kind of special is that um, publicity people like Eleanor Lambert came along and as they had clients like Adrian and Norell and um, Claire McArdle, then then the news starts to get out that these are American designs and it starts to be promoted as um, um, work by Americans. But um, I think you know there's still a tendency to think that um, it all emanates from, from Paris especially. Um, that's a machine that got going in the 19th century and um, it has been supported by the French, French state all this time and there's just not much you can do about it when um, when so much energy goes into saying this is the most perfect stuff ever, so. I think it's, um, you'd be interested in, in knowing that uh, Jesse did not advertise <coughs> at all for the first 10 years of her working. Um, she had the most, um, I think, in inventive uh, way of reaching her clients, uh, which was to send out handwritten notes to all of them several times a year telling them what was new, what was on offer in a very intimate tone, said, oh, please do come in. We've got something, uh, we've got something new to show you and we, we think you'd like it. Um, and they, every invitation was always different and it was on very expensive uh, Gorham stationery or Black Star and Frost stationery with tissue lining and it was all part of her persona. Uh, so she didn't advertise until the, um, uh, so that whole time she was in that uh, salon at 290 Park, um, she, she wasn't advertising, only until the depression, things really got slow, she started uh, advertising. In so I think one of the themes that came out very strongly in both of your talks is this ability to shape and craft a very particular identity through fashion. And that's something that we explored um, in great detail in the Jazz Age exhibition. Um, what does it say about you if you own a cocktail shaker in the shape of a Zeppelin versus if you own um, a tea service that takes its shape and form in inspiration from a historical model? So um, to Jan and Caroline, I might ask, um, what, if anything, do we know about Jesse Franklin Turner's um, self-presentation and how did she dress and present herself publicly? Um, and to Caroline, I'm interested for these um, both stage and screen actresses who are constantly shifting personas from project to project, do we see any connection or relationship to what they chose to wear and did that fluctuate? Um, you'll be, this is a good question because Jesse herself was uh, very reclusive, and she never presented herself to her clients. Um, she, I, I, I assume, left it to the saleswomen to deal with the clients, and there are very few photographs of her, but she was in no way a glamour puss. Um, she was behind the scenes, maybe like VNA. You know, <laughs> uh, there are designers who are stars, and then there are designers who are in the background. And Jessie was definitely in the background. She always wore a hat, and um, uh, uh, it, it wasn't her. Her branding was all in the way she treated her clients, in her, um, in the consistency that, in her uh, the logo that she created, um, in her. Uh, Three, her three um, salons that she created all were, um, had, had incredible color combinations and sort of an aura of, well, one was the Renaissance, the other was uh, sort of the aura of the, of the um, 
uh, of, the, of the Far East. So um, it wasn't her own self that created the, the brand and persona, but wh everything that she did. I think in general, most women fashion designers, um, um, until you get to Chanel and Scaparelli, were either ladylike or sort of decorous. I mean, they wore whatever the, the nice thing to wear was. And um, a lot of them were not beauties by the time, I mean, by the time they'd established a career that had lasted pretty long, they were got a little matronly. Um, but two things come to mind for Americans. One is um, Elizabeth Hawes, who was um, also starting out as a um, fashion designer in the 30s, and she had gone to Vassar, and she was very blue stocking. And she got a lot of press and was always doing things like sitting on the floors in her dungarees holding her scissors or um, she really portrayed herself as anti-fashion in a lot of ways. And the other is Valentina, who was um, of Russian origin and was quite, quite beautiful. Um, she's known today primarily for having dressed Garbo and for having shared him with her husband. Um, and a lot of Garbo's early style came from Valentina. I mean, a, a lot of what she wore was directly influenced by. But um, Valentina would never let anybody wear her clothes for her fashion shows in her couture salon. She, um, and she spoke in um, charming, broken English. And she would say, here for evening, and sweep in with the cape, and then remove it and say, for a white tie and whatnot. And so she just put on a show for every single showing. <laughs> so um, um, I think we're saying that there was still a lot of individuality. Um, I, I think that a show of those three designers would be so interesting because they were the three major um, designers of the American designers of the 30s, uh, and they're so different. They couldn't they and couldn't McCardle. be more different. And McCardle, please put her yeah, in. Yeah, well, I would. I'm, I'm giving McCardle the 40s. Well, her, she, she can have the whole She 40s. invented separates in the 30s. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but now we're talking. We okay. have to talk All about right, the 20s. Right. <laughs> <laughs> point do you think the um, the actresses pick, pick designers because they were chic or because they actually saw in them something that they wanted with their brand the, the stores and designers desperately wanted to dress as many actresses as possible and one thing you have to think of when you imagine going to a pretty simple play um, if you go to a simple play that um, today most of the people the women will be dressed kind of librarian style very neutral um, and in those, in the heyday of the 1890s and through the 30s, it was as if every single woman in a very regular play was wearing full-blown Alexander McQueen or Gucci. Um, they were startlingly well um, dressed for no matter what kind of role they were playing. And it was very much a part of um, promotion. And um, there were a lot of magazines that were not fashion magazines. They were theater magazine and whatnot that ran pictures of all every single possible Ziegfeld girl and anyone who was in a play. And I think it had, just to get back to your original question, nothing to do with personal actress style or the play itself. It had to do with whether Bergdorf Goodman was dressing the person or um, another store or designer. Which is a bit different from the jewelry because in those days the people who made lots of money were in fact buying their own jewelry and making and really was a case of personal statement that they would decide on rather than the company putting it on them for the Academy Awards or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, why don't we open it up to uh, questions from the floor and wait for Susanna to come because otherwise our feed won't reach uh, people uh, out of this room. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the popularity of the American designers in Europe. Were they popular as much as the Europeans were popular over here? Were they advertised in Europe like the European Not ones? at all. Not at all, no. The only one was so Man Boucher, who was from, um, where was he from? Chicago. His real name was Maine Bakker, and he started a couture house in Paris in the 30s. But, um, and yeah, there's... Very, very, very little. Um, um, I don't think it was really until after World War II that Europeans started buying American 
um, designs. And when the Paris Couture Houses decided finally to get involved in ready-to-wear, they had to come here and learn, learn how to do ready-to-wear um, because the, all the techniques and machines and how to figure out how to grade a pattern, that was all here. I was just going to add to that. That's pretty typical of the furniture, too. We had um, the equivalent of ready to wear. We had more machine made. Uh, the, uh, Macy's had a modern shop where they were copying uh, uh, Leon Jalot, but in simpler materials, and drove the French designers crazy because essentially it was early knockoffs. But the Americans throughout history have always understood the benefits of having uh, some more mass production techniques in terms of. Uh, um, sort of design and which obviously impacted the 30s hugely because uh, they were able to produce uh, modern design at a lower price point. Someone else back in the back of the room? Yes, hi. I wanted to know your thought on all the pictures you've shown in fashion. Every, almost every picture somebody's wearing a hat, a woman's wearing a hat and there's no mention up front about hats and what the significance is and it, what your thoughts are. I thought it was interesting that you're talking about all the outfits and the lingerie and the lounge pants and no mention of hats. So I was wondering what your thoughts are. Well, a well-dressed woman would not go out of the house without a hat uh, throughout, I mean, when she was put together for the day. And we're not talking about when she's wearing a tea gown, of course. But when she's put together for a day, she's always wearing a hat. And that was true right up uh, until the 60s, it be began to change. And that's when the hat gradually saw its demise. Um, but you just weren't dressed and, unless you wore a hat. And gloves. And, and stockings. Gloves. <laughs> and high heels. <laughs> and no costume jewelry. That's what being put together was. I'm, I'm curious whether there was any triple, uh, trickle-down effect of this fashion, or was it just really the wealthy and the elite that wore it, or you know, what were the people in the street wearing, and you know, what was sort of the the uh, influence, you know, of the broader mass? There was a lot of conformity. The only real difference was in terms of quality. And if you looked at a, a photograph that showed a hundred, if you looked out at this audience almost everyone would be wearing just about the same thing, but the haute couture ones would be made with better fabric and better fur and more embroidery, and the ready-to-wear ones would be in the same styles but simpler. And in general, in this country, people kept up with the styles. Um, they bought new clothes, um, and, there were, and there were affordable clothes here, so. Um. And they were, the styles were created in, in Paris, and then the trickle-down came, and they were made um, ready, ready to wear here. Um, but of course, Chanel loved that she really promoted the idea of copying. She thought it was the greatest compliment to have her clothes copied. And her clothes could be easily copied. Some other designers, it didn't work so well. But. Anyone else? Ah. So, what's happened to style? <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. Oh, what's happened to We're at a loss for words. I think one of the other interesting, I probably said, but where are your mics? It goes into the system. But one of the other interesting things to me is that we see a lot of pictures and doing our research, we went through good furniture, Vogue, all sorts of period publications, and they're all in black and white. And so the real revelation was suddenly, wow, when we get out the textiles the, from them that we have in our collection and these incredible colors. And we knew that it's, it's colorful period, but you, when you really need to see the things in person to get this big wow factor. And it's true of the clothes, it's true of the furnishing te textiles, styles, and it's true of all sorts of, you know, even the painting and the lacquering of, of, 
furniture, and I was interested what you said about the, the sort of silver leaf and so forth, and the zigzag designs, because that actually sounds just like the Donald Dusky screen upstairs. So again, there's this crossover of ornament, um, and, or rather color and line and pattern and form. So I think, I think that we, think of, you know, it's hard from the period publications to get a sense of that, but that's why we're very pleased to have so much of our collection. It's almost half. There's, uh, I think, 185 objects, including the library, out of 400, or just under 400, that are from Cooper Hewitt's collection. So this is really an opportune moment uh, to see uh, great things that have not seen the light of day in a very long time, but we hope will do so now, and they certainly do so on line and we have now the benefit of seeing all these uh, patterns and styles and designs in color that we did, wouldn't have had in the 1920s and it would have been up to somebody's imagination to visualize the color. Uh, I mean it was said to be chartreuse and black but you know the impact has got to be by a trip into the shop. Anyone else have any uh, questions? I just want to say about style because we all ask that, what, what's happened? I don't have any answer, but I, um, I think people are really, uh, the way our lives are now, people just aren't as focused on clothing and not spending, uh, 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 spending money on clothing the way we used to. But style always re remains. Um, I'm fascinated and rather love the way um, jeans are being worn now, and every in every pair of jeans is individually styled by by the cuts that are in them. And I th I think people are expressing themselves quite a lot with just the the cuts in jeans. And if you want to look at people on the street, that seems to be what's happening. And I, you know, that is a, an expression of personal style. So that's one of my thoughts. Anyway. People did did were people really looking at the actresses to be at in an aspirational way to dress like them to want to be like them in this period? They were because there were there was so much press written that so you could read how what, what they ate for dinner and how they played tennis or ping pong and how they decorated and what they I mean a lot of it was fiction but um, it's still. <laughs> It still, there was this giant appetite, especially as um, the depression came and um, everyone needed to be um, distracted and um, there was a whole machine providing all this information. And here we have an expert who can tell us the exact answer. Well, actually, I'm gonna ask you a question. Hopefully you won't throw your microphone at me. <laughs> um, when did wearing all black become so chic? So I live on the Upper East Side. I see all of these women in various forms of black, but it's, it's almost funereal. And it seems that they're very tailored and every garment is, is thoughtfully put together, but it just seems very dour. And I always wanna ask them, did they just come from a funeral? Subway, sorry, I'm screaming. <laughs> um, if you're taking a subway, you can't wear um, light colors, right? Or well, if you- <laughs> well, they ca they are the ones wearing the highest heels. Oh, they're the more elegant they think they are, the darker the clothing. Well, there's a long history of black and how it's been used for um, mourning, and when women were in constant mourning, that, so it was pretty useful to have a black wardrobe, and then. Um, in the 20s, actually, Coco Chanel was the one who made it kind of racy and sporty and new. Um, and um, it's, it's so practical and so slimming that it will <laughs> never <laughs> go away. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So it, it 
that part is really the 20s. However, what it means now, I'm not, it may be terrifying. It's great. There are a lot of other things going on there. Anyway, well, thank you all for coming, and this has been very fun for us.